everybody. Shabbat Shalom. Let's go ahead and open up in a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you for bringing us through another week that we're able to meet here on Shabbat to worship you, to glorify your name. And Father, we ask that you would help us today as we go through this lesson to understand the true meaning of grace and not to use it as extremes to give us a license to sin. In Yeshua's name we pray. Amen. Well, good morning. I'd like to open up this morning with a story from my life. Back from when I was in my preteen years, I may have been 11, 12, something like that, I decided I wanted to start reading the Bible for myself. I was a good little Southern Baptist girl, grew up in the church, knew the Sunday school stories, knew what I'd learned in the Bible at church, so I started reading it on my own. And guess what? I tackled one of those passages that a lot of people never read in their lifetime. I came across Leviticus 23 and started reading about the feasts. And some of them say, you shall do this for all your generations. And I'm sitting there, and I can still remember sitting on my bed, scratching my head and saying, but I don't even know what they are. So how can you keep them from now on? I mean, I, I was totally perplexed. But I didn't say anything to anyone. I was kind of quite shy, plus didn't want to rock the boat. We had never talked about them in our church, so I just kind of let it go. Later, I was reading the Apostolic Scriptures, the New Testament, and I, came, I started noticing something there. We had the primary characters have names like Paul, Peter, John, Timothy, everyday, ordinary Western names. But you go back to the Old Testament, and there's these names that are this long that at that stage in my life I could not even begin to pronounce, okay? Again, I'm wondering why the difference, why the shift. Another light bulb moment for me came when I was reading the Bible one day, and I came across a passage that said we're supposed to set the seventh day apart as the Sabbath. Well, even at a young age, I knew I could look at my calendar and I could see that the seventh day was Saturday, not Sunday. So again, I'm, I'm questioning, why are we doing things that are different than what the scriptures are saying? But I didn't say anything, again. Later, I heard my church give a rationale for that, um, that the apostles changed the day of worship. You cannot find that in scripture. They gave no proof text, no evidence, just that was the answer because someone had brought it up. And it was experiences such as these that really left me questioning and knowing that there was something more out there, there was something I was missing. I didn't know what it was, didn't know where to find it, but I knew it was out there somewhere. And the truth is that the vast majority of people never realize that they're missing so much because when you look at our modern Bible translations, you see they've pretty much been stripped of their Jewish heritage, as has the teachings in our modern day churches. And I'm thankful to God that even at that young age, he began to open up the fullness of his word to me and prepare me that later on I would understand what was missing. And I'll be perfectly honest, I was never fully comfortable in the church. For some reason, I was always a misfit. I never fit in. And when I became an adult, that led to my church hopping. I went not only from church to church to church, I went from denomination to denomination to denomination. I have been to almost everyone you can name. I was looking for this elusive it. I knew it was out there somewhere. And I would go to a church, I'd be in there for a while, and I would think I'd found it. Still couldn't identify what it was, but I would think, okay, it's here. Only to find out it was, and I'd start getting restless again, and I'd move on somewhere else. And it wasn't until I came through those doors back there and started attending Beth out and I that I began to discover what this it was. It is actually the Torah. It is the foundation of our faith. And when we strip out that foundation, we don't have a solid foundation to stand on. It crumbles. And so much of the New Testament cannot be explained without having that background. So once I found that, I found the mysterious it. The restlessness was gone. I never had that, felt that need to move on and start hopping from place to place again. 
And what you may be surprised to know is that as early as the first century, and when I say first century, I mean Bible times, the New Testament times, there were actually false teachers that were trying to remove the Jewishness of the gospel message and tell believers that both the commandments of God and the feasts were no longer relevant. Did you ever pick that up when you're reading the New Testament? Probably not if you come from the church because you were taught in a way that kind of concealed that. Not necessarily if they were being nefarious, they just didn't understand it themselves and you can't teach what you don't know. So this is not a modern problem. We see it throughout the apostolic scriptures if we know what to look for. The apostles taught directly against those false teachers that were teaching these things, asserting that the Torah was still applicable. And if you do a close, honest reading of the apostolic scriptures, you find out the, the apostles actually continued to keep the feast. Something that you're told in the church is not true. They were teaching against them. We also see from Paul's writing that these false teachers were often fueled by Gnosticism. And that's a modern term that categorizes a collection of ancient religions whose adherents shunned the material world, which they viewed as being created by this demiurge, and they embraced the spiritual world. And we don't have time to explore Gnosticism in today's lesson, but for purposes of our discussion today, just know that the abuse of grace was indeed a part of Gnosticism, and that's what I want to talk about today. In a future class, I'm hoping to delve in a little bit into Gnosticism and let you see how it has really influenced the beliefs in the Western world and Christianity, as a, a, definitely. I did a teaching on the book of Jude a couple of years ago, and we saw then how Jude had warned his readers about false grace teachers in verse 4 of that letter, and I'll read that one verse to you very quickly. They, these false grace teachers, are ungodly people who pervert the grace of our God into indecency and deny our only master and Lord, Yeshua, the Messiah. And we also see a similar warning from Paul in a number of his writings, so we won't go through those. I've already talked about Paul a good bit in previous lessons, and we'll probably get back to Paul's teachings in some future lessons as well, because they're very important to understand the truth of what Paul is saying. Solomon, the wisest man who ever lived, tells us in Ecclesiastes that there is nothing new under the sun. So it shouldn't surprise us to see that today we're battling basically the same issues they battled in the first century. What is new today, however, is that this perversion of the grace message is no longer out on the fringes. Back then, this was the fringe element. Today, it is within the mainstream Christianity. Just turn on your television set to, to whatever your favorite Christian station is. If you're watching a preacher, odds are that preacher is actually an adherent to this teaching. Taking grace to its extreme. Not all of them are, but the majority, unfortunately, that are popular on television and radio are. This preferred, perverted form of grace teaching is often referred to as hyper-grace. And that essentially means that the message of grace has been taken to its extreme so that it allows a person to sin without feeling the need to repent. It's an important topic because sadly, some teachers who hold this view go so far as to invalidate Yeshua's own teaching when he walked on this earth. They say that his teachings prior to his resurrection were taught while we were still under the law. So, because that was the case, they no longer apply. I can't, okay, there we go. I cannot cover everything about this important topic in one hour. So what I wanna do is recommend this book to you. It's from Dr. Michael L. Brown. You may be familiar with him, very respected scholar. It's called Hypergrace. Exposing the dangers of the modern grace message, and it gives a really in-depth understanding of what this message is and why it's dangerous and how to identify it. And Dr. Brown does name names in his books. This morning I'm not going to be naming names, and we'll talk about why in a few moments. But I really like this book because it's balanced. Dr. Brown points out both the good and the bad uh, aspects of these teachers. He doesn't just focus on the bad. And he acknowledges that many people 
who have been, have been blessed by these teachers' teachings. But even though that's the case, we have to be aware of how dangerous their teaching is when it comes to this perversion of grace. So before we get into the lesson, I want to make it perfectly clear. I am not teaching against grace. Without grace, we would all be doomed. Grace is very real and it's very precious. It's throughout the entire Bible, right there in your opening pages in Genesis. When man and woman disobeyed God, what did God do? He gave the, the first sacrifice. He killed a precious animal, something that he loved and had proclaimed as being very good to cover their sin. That was grace. And it's because of God's grace and only because of his grace that we have been redeemed. What I am talking about today is the unfortunate turn that it's taking, the distortion, making it a license to sin, which is something Paul taught against. Charles Spurgeon, most of you may, remember, may recognize that name, he warned about the abuse of grace as far back as 1883. And I want to quote something that he wrote. I have admitted that a few human beings have turned the grace of God into lasciviousness. But I trust no one will ever argue against any doctrine on account of the perverse use made of it by the baser sort. In other words, some people may be misusing this, but grace is still real. Don't throw grace out just because some people are perverting it. Cannot every truth be perverted? Is there a single doctrine of scripture into which graceless hands have not twisted into mischief? Is there not an almost infinite ingenuity in wicked men for making evil out of good? If we are to condemn a truth because of the misbehavior of individuals who profess to believe it, we should be found condemning our Lord himself for what Judas did. And our holy faith would die at the hands of apostates and hypocrites. Let us act like rational men. We do not find fault with ropes because poor insane creatures have handed themselves therewith. Nor do we ask that the wares of Sherfeld, which was where metal objects were made, may be destroyed because edged tools are the murderer's instruments. So put it in modern terms and to borrow a very well-known cliche, don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. Spurgeon's concern was not anything new. As I mentioned a few moments ago, it goes back to the first century. And we see it, as I mentioned earlier, in the writings of both Jude, Yeshua's brother, and Paul. The problem is not grace. The problem is the perversion of the grace message, which unfortunately many are using as a license to sin. Grace truly liberates us from the bondage of legalism but it should not be used to free us from God's standards. A lot of this stems from a simple fact. These teachers believe that once a person is saved, he or she is forgiven of not only past and present sins, but of future sins as well. According to their view, it is wrong to ask God to forgive you when you sin today. Think about that. And it is very wrong to think that your forgiveness is based on your forgiving others, despite Yeshua's words to the contrary in Matthew 6 in the Lord's Prayer. Yeshua included the petition, forgive us our debts, that is our sins, as we have forgiven our debtors or those who have sinned against us. And he then added, for if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your father forgive your trespasses. Modern grace teachers are adamant that Yeshua's words are no longer applicable. In their view, when he walked the earth, people were still under the law. So once he died and he was resurrected, the age of grace came and things he taught were no longer really valid. So there's no need to forgive others. There's no need to ask for repent, you know, to repent and ask for forgiveness when you sin. But think about this. I mean, really think about it. Does it even make sense? Why would Yeshua spend those three precious years of his short ministry, 
teaching his disciples in depth about the true meaning of God's commands and how to properly keep the Torah if he knew that once he died and he was resurrected, that those things he was teaching would no longer be valid. Why would he not spend that time teaching them that, okay, you know this, but when I die, guess what? The age of grace is coming. You don't need to worry about these things anymore. Did he do that? No, he did not do that. That would have given them pretty much freedom to do anything they wanted to do because he had paid for their sins, their past, present, and future sins. So there would be no need to repent because the price had been paid. But that is not what he did, and that is, in fact, an explicit contradiction to what the Bible tells us. As evidence, in this week's readings from the Bret Hadashah, we see just the opposite. We see Yeshua actually expanding on God's laws. We read about the Ten Commandments this week. And we saw how Yeshua went and took the Ten Commandments to a new level. He went much further than Moses did. He equated lusting after a woman as being the same as adultery. So you don't actually have to commit the act. You just need to think about it. Same thing with murder. If you hate a person, you're guilty of murder. The rich young man who came to him and wanted to know how to inherit eternal life, what did he tell him? Keep the commandments. He told Yeshua, I've done that all my life. Okay, great. Perfect. That's good. But now you have one more thing you need to do. You need to sell all your riches and give it to the poor. In other words, just keeping the commandments is not enough, but you are still expected to keep those commandments. And the reality, which these grace teachers really don't want to hear, is that Yeshua's law is actually much stricter than the law of Moses and that law that they teach against. For the most part, and this one turned out really dark, didn't it? It says the error of hypergrace, in case you can't read it. Look fine on my computer screen. Oh, well. For the most part, I will not be revealing names, as I said earlier. Actually, I'm not going to reveal any names. Because many of these teachers in areas other than the area of grace are pretty much on, on target with their teaching. And they've blessed a lot of people, and it's not my intention to get up here and disparage any of them. I just want to make you aware of what's being taught, because I want you to be, as Yeshua said, wise as serpents and innocent as doves. I want to give you the tools that you need to be able to identify these teachings so that you won't be drawn into their deception. And I also want to reiterate that many of these teachers are not our enemies. Many people have been truly blessed by their ministries. And you may be wondering how, if someone is teaching something that isn't scripturally sound, how can that be a blessing? And I want to give you a couple of examples. Contemporary Christian music was born from the Jesus movement of the 60s and 70s. In its very early days, its mission, sole mission, was to spread the gospel message. You may remember people like Keith Green and a number of others that we just go through right now. They weren't interested in making money, seeking a name for themselves. And the industry was very different than it is today. Sadly, the contemporary Christian music scene today, it's not a lot different than its secular counterpart. It's a money-making machine. And artists are elevated depending on whether they have a certain personality and they, if the industry thinks that they can make money for them. I mean, it's basically what it's about now. There's still some really good people out there. I'm not disparaging contemporary Christian music. But there's also some people out there whose lifestyles don't line up with the scripture. Okay? So you have to be careful. But even in that case, listen to the words. The words, a lot of people don't know these artists and don't know what the ones who aren't living up to that lifestyle, don't know what they're doing, but they hear the words, they're blessed by the words, so it's still a blessing to them. And it's the same with these hyper-grace teachers. For most of them, there are areas where they are strongly on target with their message, so they can encourage and bless people. And, but we need to line up their message with the Word of God before we accept it. And here's the other example. I said I wanted to give you two examples. Last week, as you know, we had a really severe cold spell here in Atlanta. We've got another one coming up here this coming week. There is a church, I won't identify even the area, but it's outside of the metro Atlanta area. And it's in a rural area. It's um, not well known. If I gave you the pastor's name or the church's name, you'd probably say never heard of them. But what I want to do tell you about 
is this pastor had to give up his previous church because of his some, some sinful decisions he made. Let's just leave it at that. He made some really bad decisions, did some things that were not in line with scripture and was forced out of his previous church. So he went and started a new church and some of the people went with him and followed him. The reason they followed him is because this man has a true heart to help people in need. And so last week when this cold spell hit, he was one of the first to get out there, open his doors. If anybody needed a place to come and get warm, or if they needed food, he was right there to help them, and he always does things like this. So he does have a heart. He just is very much a grace church, hyper-grace church, I should say. So the teaching impacts who you are and decisions you make. So we ha that's why it's so dangerous. We have to be careful. It allowed him to fall into sin, which he's realized now is wrong. He's repented of that. But it did happen. So his ministry is truly blessing a lot of people, even though there's that error of grace message out there. And I do want you to understand this. Grace is extremely important. And I am very thankful for grace. Without it, I wouldn't be standing here today. But grace without truth leads to sin. Likewise, the truth, Torah, without grace results in legalism. So there has to be a balance between the two. Many hyper-grace teachers do not want to hear how wrong their teaching is. And in fact, they will use some pretty strong words to those who disagree with them. They'll call them legalistic, Pharisee, a law keeper, being under the law, in bondage, or even worse. So if you hear one of these teachers making these kind of comments, it's, you can pretty much suspect that, or pretty much know that they are one of the hyper-grace teachers and that they adhere to that theology. Dr. Brown prints part of a letter from a lady he received that attended one of those churches. And it's pretty eye-opening. So I want to, it reveals the dangers of where this can lead. It doesn't always lead here, I say that. But I do want you to understand why this distorted view of grace can be dangerous. I want to read just a portion of that letter. I have seen firsthand the changes that come with people who embrace this message, the hypergrace message. I joined a small group three years ago that went from having regular prayer meetings and living holy connected lives together to stating prayer is a work and denies grace and sin allows grace to do its great work. All of our prayer meetings and Bible studies were traded in for game nights and nights out at the bar to witness where many from the group got plastered, all in the name of grace. My heart has been so broken for my dear friends who I walk so closely with. As a group, they have embraced sin as not only acceptable, but justified and desirable. I have been completely ostracized and mocked for my stand in holiness. They don't even call me by my name anymore. They call me Pharisee. Unfortunately, I have tried to step completely away from these loved ones and am spending my life in prayer for them. So that, le that letter speaks volumes. And as I said, not everyone who gets involved with this message goes to that extreme, but it is a slippery slope and can lead to such a deplorable condition. God takes sin very seriously, so we should not make light of it. And we definitely shouldn't view sin as nothing to be concerned about. As I stated a few moments ago, grace is extremely important, but grace without truth leads to sin. And likewise, the truth or Torah without grace can result in legalism. And as you saw from the letter I just shared, people who accept this perverted grace teaching begin over time to accept sin. In fact, it becomes desirable as it did with these people did because in their view, it makes grace abound even more. Where have we heard those words? This is a perverted teaching of it, but that, those are biblical words. But that is the exact opposite of the lifestyle that the Lord calls us to. These hypergrace teachers are not trying intentionally to lead people astray. They sincerely believe that their message is true. They are convinced it is the message that the body needs today. They have a passion to reach people with the gospel, rescuing souls 
from the enemy and preparing them for eternity. They are teaching what they believe to be the message of biblical grace. But unfortunately, they are erroneously distorting, exaggerating, and misinterpreting the message to a dangerous degree in order to make it attractive to people. That's what they want to do. They want to package the gospel message in a way that the masses will accept it without really understanding the power of the gospel message. Some of these teachers will become very defensive when confronted with their error, and they'll make some very hateful, judgmental attacks. Thankfully, it's only a small handful, but there are some that have. And I want to give you some comments here that were made against Dr. Brown. Grace is extremely threatening to the law preachers because they stand to lose so much when people get grace. And they are threatened right now. That's why people like Michael Brown are speaking out about hyper-grace. They are losing ground big time. People are getting the revelation of the finished work of the cross in their thousands. They, Brown and others who teach the truth about grace and holy living, are desperate, desperately pulling out the license to sin stuff and the great end time deception stuff to falsely portray what we are preaching. But it is sadly not working. Expect them to continue to bleat, but it's all for nothing. We aren't going anywhere. We intend to increase our efforts and take as many as we can from the clutches of religion, exclamation point. There ain't anything they can do about it. So much for unity in the body. In fact, one of the dangers that you see in this movement is actually a division within the body. I've used this example before, but think back to Yeshua just before he was arrested. According to John, he got alone to pray to his father as he did every day. And as he was praying for his disciples, he began to pray for all of those who would believe in him. Not just the disciples that were with him then, but all of us, which includes you and I. John 17, verses 20 through 23 says this, and these are Yeshua's words. I pray not on behalf of these, but also for those who believe in me through their message that they, will, they all may be one. Just as you, Father, are in me and I am in you, so also may they be one in us, so the world may believe that you sent me. The glory that you have given to me, I have given to them, that they may be one just as we are, I in them and you in me, that they may be perfected in unity, so that the world may know that you sent me and love them as you loved me. Pretty clear Yeshua wanted his followers, and not just the first century followers, but all of us, even those of us today, to be united in love and to love one another. He didn't want divisions. And this movement unfortunately divides because it disparages those who seek to live holy and righteous lives before God by being, to, being obedient to his word. And according to his adherents, they, the adherents, are enlightened. But those of us who are trying to follow God's commands have not become enlightened, and we are still living in the religious stone age. So that when you level insinuations like that at people, you are actually creating a lack of unity. You're not unifying, you're dividing. Now to be fair, so let's hit the other side of the coin. There are believers who are truly legalistic. There are extremes in both directions. But the simple rejection of the hypergrace message should not result in being classified as someone who stands against the truth of God's word, because God's word requires obedience and turning from sin. Just read the scriptures for yourself. You will see over and over again, both in the Gospels and in the New Testament letters, that once we accept Yeshua as our Messiah, we are directed to live a life of holiness which means separating ourselves from sin instead of treating it lightly. Now I want to spend a few minutes talking about some of the doctrines that these teachers preach to help you be able to identify them for yourself. One, as I mentioned a few moments ago, is that when we accept Yeshua as our Savior, all of our sins are forgiven, past, present, future. Many of these teachers teach that there is no more need to repent from any sin that you commit because it has already been forgiven. And in a sense, they're correct. 
When Yeshua died on the cross, he paid for all of our sins. The debt was satisfied. However, we need to realize that we are not forgiven of our sins until we confess them and repent from them. That is an important distinction. We see throughout the book of Acts that the apostles urged their listeners to turn away from their sins and be saved. And it's that distinction. That's why they did that. So I want to give you an example that I think you can get your arms around here. Let's say you owe a debt. Perhaps it's a car or a home. But you cannot afford to pay off that debt because you've lost your job. So you just have absolutely no means. I mean, you're in trouble here. But a kind, generous person comes along and decides to pay your debt for you. And not only to pay off this debt, but to give you enough money that you can pay off any debts you may incur in the future. And they put it in your bank account for you. If that money is sitting in your bank account, does that satisfy your debt? No. In order for your financial debt to be forgiven, you have to first be aware that you owe the money. So you have to acknowledge it. You have to acknowledge the money's there. You have to know that there's the means to pay it off. And then you have to act on that by applying the money toward that outstanding debt. Only then will that debt actually be forgiven. So what you've just done is to allow someone else to pay your debt. And it's the same with Yeshua. He has paid the penalty for us, but we have to accept it when we accept him. And we have to cash it in, if you will, if you want to use those terms. We have to confess, we have to repent, and we have to accept him as our Lord and Savior. Yeshua is the one who actually paid the debt that we owed in this regard. So now let's go back to this example of a financial debt and talk about future debts. Does the fact that we have paid off our initial debt cancel our future debts? No, I go out, I take out another loan, I can't pay it, I'm still in trouble, okay? That first loan had absolutely nothing to do with the second one. Remember that kind, generous person who gave us the money provided a sufficient amount to cover any future debts we might incur. So the money's there to pay it off, okay? But it's not satisfied, even though the money's out there. It's the same way with our sins. We have to, when we accept the Lord, all sins that we have already committed are forgiven. Just like we paid off that first debt. That money went, it paid it off, done. That's because that was the debt that was owed at that time. The penalty has been paid for the future sins. But guess what? Just as with the future debts, in the case of this loan, we've got to go get that money out of the bank, and we've got to put it on that second mortgage or car loan or whatever that debt is, we've got to actually do it. So we have to do something. Again, we have to acknowledge that we owe it, and we actually have to take action. Same thing with our sins. When we sin, we have to acknowledge our sin, which is confessing it to God. We have to repent of it, turn away from it, and ask for his forgiveness. And at that point, Yeshua's atoning work will pay for that debt, and we will be forgiven. Make sense? So. The reality that there is that there is not a single verse in the Bible that tells us that we are forgiven of sins we have not yet committed. And let me say that one again because this is important. The reality is that there is not a single verse in the Bible that tells us that we are forgiven of sins that we have not yet committed. All of the promises of forgiveness in God's word deal with sins that have already been committed or are presently being committed. And yes, we have examples of Yeshua teaching about forgiveness of present and past sins, indicating in those teachings that we need to continue to confess and ask forgiveness for future sins. One example, the Lord's Prayer. He taught his disciples to pray, give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins, for we ourselves forgive everyone who is indebted to us. And then in another passage in Mark 11, verse 25, he states, and whenever you stand praying, forgive. If you have anything against anyone, so that your Father who is in heaven may forgive you your trespasses. Now, let me show you what's happening here. If all of our sins have already been forgiven, why would Yeshua instruct his followers to pray on an ongoing basis for forgiveness? 
Why wouldn't he say, you've accepted me, your sins are forgiven, you don't need to talk about them to God anymore? He didn't do that. He said, confess. This was supposed to be a daily prayer. Confess, confess, repent. Yes, our sins have been paid for. But since we haven't committed future sins yet, we are unable to forgive, receive forgiveness for them. When we commit those future sins, we can then confess our sin and be forgiven of that sin. Just as future monetary debts can only be forgiven once they are incurred and we provide the money to the lender. Now, let me be clear on something else. I keep saying let me be clear, but there's some important things here. I don't want what I'm saying to be misunderstood in any way. Being forgiven of future sins is not to be confused with salvation. Those are two separate things. We can be saved and still sin, but because we are saved, we should recognize our sin and repent of it, okay? So they are two different things. If we're living in a life of perpetual sin, then we may want to question if we're really saved, but salvation and sinning, we're human, we will make mistakes and we will sin. But the Holy Spirit will convict us and lead us to repentance. On the other hand, hypergrace teachers typically assert that we shouldn't be conscious of our sins because they have been paid for. In other words, we shouldn't acknowledge that we have sinned, but is that really what the Bible tells us? And let's consider Paul for starters. We see throughout the Pauline writings that Paul saw the sins of the people and he grieved over them. So how can we really believe that God, who knows everything, no longer sees them and doesn't want us to repent? I want to look at 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 21 as an example. And this is Paul speaking. I am afraid that when I come again, my God may humiliate me before you, and I will mourn for many of those who have sinned before and not repented of the impurity and sexual immorality and indecency which they committed. Here we see Paul speaking to believers who he fears have continued to sin and not repented of those sins. If we are not to be conscious of our sins, why would Paul write something like this? Again, this is one of those things that just doesn't make sense when you step back and really look at it. We also see in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 27 through 32, that there are consequences to our sins. Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the Lord's cup in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But a man must examine himself and then let him eat of the bread and drink from the cup. For the one who eats and drinks without recognizing the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. For this reason, many among you are weak and sick, and quite a few have died. For if we were judging ourselves thoroughly, we wouldn't be coming under judgment. But when we are judged, we are being disciplined by the Lord so that we might not be condemned along with the world. And in this passage, we see Paul putting his readers, who are believers, and this is important, on notice that sin has caused sickness and even death. To hypergrace teachers and adherents, this sounds legalistic. And when confronted with texts such as these, they often counter back with Hebrews 10, 17, where we're told that God no longer, no longer remembers our sins. But they stop at that verse. If you keep reading in that chapter, you'll find something very important. So if you skip down to Hebrews 10, verses 26 through 31, we're told this. For if we keep on sinning willfully after we have received the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but only a terrifying expectation of judgment and a fury of fire about to devour, devour the enemies of God. Anyone who rejected the Torah of Moses dies without compassion on the word of two or three witnesses. How much more severe do you think the punishment will be for the one who has trampled Ben Elohim, the Son of God, underfoot and has regarded as unholy the blood of the covenant by which he was made holy and has insulted the spirit of grace? For we know the one who said, vengeance is mine, I will repay. And again, Adonai will judge his people. It is a terrifying thing to fall into the hands of the living God. This letter was written to believers, not unbelievers. Their past sins were forgiven, but Paul tells them if they turned their back on the Lord or went back to the system of man-made religion or they chose sin, there would no longer remain a sacrifice for those sins. In other words, they wouldn't be forgiven of those. But there would be a fearful expectation of judgment and a fury of fire that would consume the enemies of God. 
they had, by doing so, insulted the spirit of grace. So think about this. If future sins are forgiven without the need to confess and repent, how do we explain passages such as Revelation chapters 20, or excuse me, chapters 2 and 3, where Yeshua exposed the sins of his people and he told the believers in Ephesus that they had left their first love? He then rebuked the believers in Pergamum for holding to teaching that encouraged idolatry and immorality. He called the believers in Thyatira to account for tolerating the teaching of Jezebel. He rebuked the believers in Laodicea for being lukewarm, self-deceived, and proud. If the hypergrace teachers are correct, then these sins should, have been a, should not have been apparent to Yeshua. They should have been erased without the need to repent. But instead, we see Yeshua calling each of them to repentance, offering them grace if they repented, while at the same time giving them warnings if they refused to repent. This is after his death and resurrection, okay? So don't go back to saying, oh, it was while there people were still under the law. This is after. Why would Yeshua do this if their sins were already forgiven and if God no longer wanted them to have any consciousness of sin? So some things to think about. Certainly, Yeshua of all people would understand the true message of grace. So this raises the question, should believers confess their sins to God and ask forgiveness or not? And I suspect all of us would say, yes, we should. But many of these false teachers feel otherwise. And I want to give you a quote from one of them that gives you a good understanding of their mindset. And this is his quote. I want to tell you, know that there is no scripture in the New Covenant for New Covenant believers that tells you you have got to continually confess your sins and repent of your sins and ask forgiveness for all your sins. Why not? Because one sacrifice for all time, for all of your sins, has already dealt with every single one of your sins. But as we've already talked about, that statement's incorrect, because there are such verses. We've already looked at two scriptures where Yeshua himself told the people to repent on an ongoing basis. And if you read your Bible, you'll find others. Here's another eye-opening statement from one of these teachers. You may have sinned and feel a bit guilty and want to say sorry to God and to ask for forgiveness now. The heart is not wrong. That is not bad. The heart is right. But the full revelation of the finished work of the cross is not in the heart. It is okay to say, God, I'm sorry. I did not want to do that. That's not part of my new creation nature. You know what, God, though? I am not going to get all morbid and introspective and sorrowful and guilty. You don't want that. You want me to lift up my head, get in the spirit, and stay in the spirit, and thank you for the free gift of righteousness and total forgiveness. And I fix my eyes on Jesus, who has forgiven me of all my sins. I thank you that I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Now, in all fairness, much of what that teacher says is, is accurate. God does indeed want us to be victorious, and he wants us to thank him for these gifts that he's given us. He, he has made a provision for our forgiveness. But there's some serious flaws in what that teacher said. It is okay to say, I'm sorry. But why is it not okay to ask for forgiveness when the Bible explicitly tells us to do that? According to this writer, asking for forgiveness is the same as the sin of unbelief. But is that really grace? And is it true that we should not confess our sins and ask for forgiveness? No, that's not true. This position actually comes from a faulty understanding of 1 John 1, 9, which tells the readers that they need to confess their sins to God. And it says this, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to give us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. And that sounds pretty straightforward. But these teachers falsely assert that this statement applies to non-believers or Gnostics that were in the congregation and not to believers. But if you read the entire letter of 1 John, you will clearly see that the message was directed toward believers and not unbelievers. And biblical scholars overwhelmingly confirm that fact that this letter was written to believers. So that is a faulty mis misunderstanding of that verse. And there's another thing too. The Greek word that's used for confess in this passage actually speaks of a continuous, present action as opposed to a one-time act.
One Greek authority, who is A.T. Robertson, explains that the text literally says, if we keep on confessing, not just confess. So in reality, the Greek passage would read this, a literal translation would be, if we keep on confessing our sins. He is faithful and righteous to forgive our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. So it adds a little different twist when you understand what that Greek word really means. So let me once again clarify something. Keep doing this, but I, I want to make certain you understand this. Asking for forgiveness of a sin we've committed is not the same as salvation. Once we're saved, we enter into a relationship with God. The forgiveness we're talking about today actually impacts our relationship with our Heavenly Father. That relationship's already there, but how healthy is it? Sin actually interrupts that relationship. When we sin, we sin against Him. So we need to confess, ask forgiveness, and repent or turn from that sin. In fact, we mentioned earlier that Yeshua taught that very thing in the prayer He gave His disciples that we know as the Lord's Prayer. Another very common teaching in this movement is that the Holy Spirit does not convict believers of sin because God has already forgiven and forgotten all our sins and therefore he sees us as perfect in Yeshua. And for that reason, he will never again bring our sins to our attention. One of these teachers went so far as to say this, the Holy Spirit never convicts Christians of your sin. He never comes to point out your faults. It does not take a revelation from the Holy Spirit to see that you have failed. However, when you know that you failed, what you need to do is for the Holy Spirit to convict you of your righteousness. Hmm. Some even go so far to claim that the Holy Spirit does not convict unsaved sinners of their sin, despite the Bible clearly stating that in John 16, 8, that when he comes, he will convict the world about sin, righteousness, and judgment. Okay. One well-known teacher made this claim. It is pointless to hope or pray that the Holy Spirit will convict an unbeliever of the things they are doing wrong. He's not going to convict for one simple reason. Their sins are not the problem. Christ dealt with their sins on the cross. When he said, it is finished, he was including the world, not just those who have already believed the gospel. You see the specific sins the detailed misbehavior of a person who isn't trusting in Jesus Christ are just indicative of a deeper problem. And that same teacher even stated, repentance is not the event in which a person twists the arm of a reluctant God to forgive. God forgave even before you were born. But is that true? Yes, he made a way for our forgiveness. But were we actually forgiven before we were born? If you look through the Bible, you'll see a number of verses that tell us otherwise. Once it talks about in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses, verse 21, and then again in chapter 2, verse 13, it makes these statements. Once you were alienated from God and hostile in your attitude by wicked deeds. When you were dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive together with him when he pardoned us in all our transgressions. And in John 8, 23 and 24 it says, Yeshua said, you are from below, I am from above. You are of this world, I am not of this world. Therefore, I told you that you will die in your sins. If you don't believe that I am, you will die in your sins. So those verses are very clear that we were not born in a forgiven state. It's an act. We have to actually accept Yeshua in order to be forgiven. Yeshua would not tell us that we would die in our sins unless we believe in him. And let me point out, believing in him is more than just saying he's real. It's following him and obeying his father's commands, just as Yeshua taught. Scripture also emphatically teaches that unbelievers will be judged for their sins. If they're born in a forgiven state, why would they be judged for their sins? And it also teaches that the Holy Spirit does convict. He convicts unbelievers of their unbelief in Yeshua, and he convicts sinners of their sin. And he even convicts believers when they need correcting. And I want you to notice there is a distinction between the word convict and condemn. He does not condemn believers. He convicts us. He reveals to us what we're doing wrong, lets us know that we've done something that we need to repent and turn from. But he does not condemn the believer. 
Dr. Brown, in his book, sums up conviction and the need to repent as follows. God loves us more than we can possibly imagine. And because sin is so destructive, when we become insensitive to the Lord and get caught up in disobedience, his spirit makes us aware of our sin and makes us uncomfortable in it. Praise God for that. Calling us to turn away from that sin and turn back to him. That is God's grace at work. That is the love of the Father. That is the path to life. Embrace it, and it will help you live in him to the fullest. And the position of hypergrace teachers boils down to this, sanctification. The Bible teaches us that sanctification is progressive. In other words, we have been sanctified, we are being sanctified, and we will be sanctified. The Holy Spirit is working in our lives, bringing us into conformity with his position in Messiah. And that's an ongoing work throughout our lives. We will not be perfectly sanctified until we enter his presence for all eternity. But according to these teachers, we attained the status of perfection when we accepted the Lord. And I don't know about you, I can only speak for myself, I'm not perfect. I have not reached that level yet. And I don't expect to do that here on this earth, in this human body. The fact that we still have sinful desires, quarrels, and other things that are not of God is proof that we are not yet sanctified. Just go back and read the book of James and you'll quickly see that's, that's the case. When these teachers tell us that we have been sanctified, they are partly correct because our sanctification has been purchased by the work of Messiah, but we are on a journey to its completion, and that will culminate when we meet him face to face. Sanctification is a lifestyle that requires action and obedience, not something that automatically happened when we were saved. But these teachers take the position that if we try to live holy and do what is right, we are essentially trying to earn our salvation. How many times have you heard that one? But that's not correct. It is because we are sanctified that we give up our unrighteous ways. There's a lot of facts that are very important that are covered in Dr. Brown's book that I don't have time to get into. I would strongly encourage you to get that book. It's called Hyper Grace read it. It'll give you a really good grasp of the true grace message versus the distorted message. And what I want to do now is wrap up with a quick discussion about Marcion. Has anyone here ever heard of Marcion? Marcion the heretic. Okay. He was an influential heretical church leader who died more than 1800 years ago. But his influence is still felt today. His basic position was that the God of the Old Testament was different than the God of the New Testament. We ever heard that one? He rejected the Old Testament and even portions of the New Testament, including the Gospels. Okay? He instead focused on the teachings of Paul and his message of grace, which he distorted. I've taught several lessons on Paul, and as I said before, it's important that we recognize the truth of Paul's teachings because they have been so twisted and misunderstood for so long. Uh, some of these Many Bible teachers have completely missed the mark when it comes to Paul and his writings. And it just continues, so it's important to set the record straight on him. He did not teach against Judaism. He did not teach against the Torah, as many people claim. But instead, he was proud of his Jewish heritage and was an avid Torah keeper. He even referred to himself in the present tense of, I am a Pharisee. Not I was, I am a Pharisee. These modern-day grace teachers hold many of the same views as Marcion something that's not widely known. One of these teachers wrote the following in one of his books, and this one is pretty telling here, and I want you to listen closely to what he had to say, because I want to point out some things afterwards. At the risk of sounding critical, it remains a sad reality that the Bible society chose to combine the Old and New Testaments into one single book. The single decision has caused widespread confusion within the ranks of believers throughout the world. Many of the writings in the Bible before the cross portray God to be a harsh, cruel be being set on destroying and punishing people if they dared to disobey the set of moral standards represented by the Ten Commandments and the other laws." End quote. Now, there's a lot wrong with that statement. And for starters, let me set the record straight. There was no quote-unquote Bible society that made the decision to include the Old Testament with the New Testament in our Bibles. That's a complete misrepresentation. 
the Old Testament was the Bible for the first believers. And over a period of time, other books, which eventually came to be known as the New Testament, were added to the Old Testament. As Dr. Brown points out in his book on this subject, the Old Testament was always recognized as the inspired, God-breathed foundation for everything that followed. As it has often been said, the Old Testament is the New Testament concealed, and the New Testament is the Old Testament revealed. If a person is correctly taught the Old Testament, there is no widespread confusion, as this author said. Any confusion is only because there is a perverted message of grace being taught. As for God being cruel, God himself provided a way for our salvation. How is that cruel? He is the father of our Messiah, Yeshua, and he's not some foreign, lesser God as Marcion believed. Believing God to be harsh and cruel indicates that a person doesn't fully understand who he really is. As I mentioned at the opening, what did he do when Adam and Eve fell? He immediately found a way to cover up their nakedness. And, he, and I didn't talk about this, but he sealed off the tree of life because if they ate of that, they would live forever in a perverted, sinful state. And that was an act of grace. There's grace from the opening pages of Genesis all the way to the end of Revelation. Just look for it, it's there. Unfortunately, misunderstandings like these are often prevalent among the ranks of these hyper-grace teachers. As one example, one of the best-known false grace teachers even ran an ad for one of his teaching series, and it proclaimed, quote, Are you confused about the nature of God? Is he the God of judgment found in the Old Testament, or the God of grace and mercy found in the New Testament? So it's pitting him. It, 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 is he either or? No, he is the God of grace throughout the whole Bible. So clearly, we see that the spirit of Marcion is still with us. That's why it's so important for each of us to be able to discern the true grace message from the false grace message, because our eternal destiny may well hang in the balance there. In a few weeks, I'll be back teaching, and unless God tells me otherwise, we're going to talk a little bit more about Gnosticism. Uh, we're going to talk about how Greek culture influenced the body of Messiah in the early days of the church and how its influence is still felt today. But to close it, our sweet little darling of social media and prevalent meme, little precious grumpy cat, if yeah, you don't yeah. recognize her. Her name is Tartar Sauce. Tartar, yeah, Tartar Sauce is her true name. Even she knows hypergrace is not to be believed. She says, no, don't accept it. So take it from her own mouth. Why is a little kitty? So let's go ahead and close. Dear Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for all your goodness. We want to thank you, Father, for your word. We want to thank you for the grace that you've given us. Without that grace, none of us would be here today. None of us would have the privilege of knowing you, of being able to come before you, to praise you, to worship you, to talk to you, to lift up our needs to you. Father, it's because you're a good God, and you've always been a good God. You've been a good God from the beginning. Help us to be able to spot these false teachings and, and to realize that the teachers in and of themselves are not the problem because many of them do have, they have the right heart attitude. They want to reach people with your message, but they've just accepted a distorted view. They're not doing it to try to teach people a false message. We just pray that you would bring true revelation to their heart and let them see what they're doing because many people have been hurt and led into sin because of this message. And Father, we just want to live holy lives before you and do the best that we can be through the power of your spirit to be a light in this world of darkness. And we just thank you, Father, for all you've done. In Yeshua's name, amen.